few Bibles open to Mark chapter 5. In Mark's account, how many demoniacs were there? If you go to Matthew's account, how many demoniacs are spoken of there? Two. Ever wonder why there is a discrepancy? If you're looking to, for me to answer that, I don't have that. I just wondered if you ever wonder about that. Does it make the story any less true whether there was one or two? One of the things is that, again, if you read Desire of Ages, when she comes across this story, she tells you there was two as well. Mark may have just been focusing on, out of the two, the one that was the worst. You understand what I'm saying? What I want to talk to you about this morning is Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand just who and what He really is. Why is it that we have no problem understanding the power of the devil, but yet we doubt the power of Jesus Christ? Now, I have an answer for that. And the answer is it's because we see evil on a regular basis. And it's not hard for us to fathom how powerful the devil is by how evil our world is. Right? Does that make sense to you guys? Sometimes it's hard to understand the power of Jesus because sometimes we don't see a lot of good in our day-to-day -day life. But this story is put here so that you understand the power of a Savior that is also your God. Now, this story is in Matthew's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, and Luke's Gospel. So three out of the four record this story. And they also record what happened prior to this incident. And I'm sure that all of you are familiar with what takes place before they get to the uh, shore of the Gadarenes. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Or, I'm sorry, Mark. Mark chapter 5. Paul read it, and before we go there, let's look at chapter 4 and verse 35. This will set the tone for a day in the life of the disciples and what you get when you hang out with Jesus. Okay? On the same day, this is verse 35 of chapter 4, on the same day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to what? The other, the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. Now, to get the backdrop of what's going on here is Jesus wanted to escape the multitudes. Okay. Now have you ever been into uh, the middle of a crowd of about 150 or 200 people? Have you ever gone to like Disney World or Universal Studios and been in a crowd of like a thousand people? Okay, these numbers are nothing compared to what were following Jesus at the height of this point of his ministry. To the point where when he taught them, he had to get out into the boat because there wasn't enough room for him with all the people. And he got out of the boat and he taught them. So wherever he went, great multitudes followed him. Now, you've got to understand that Jesus was a very balanced man. And his whole life was balanced. He knew that there was a time to pray. He knew there was a time to work. And he knew there was a time to rest. And so he tells his disciples, let's get in a boat and go to the other side. Why did he want to go to the other side? To get away from the multitudes so he could find peace and rest. Those of you that like to burn the candle on both ends, eventually the wax will melt and you will have nothing left. Okay? Jesus never gave us that kind of example. Amen. Okay? So, they get into this boat. Jesus, like I said, had spent his energy 
in teaching, in healing. And he gets into the boat, and what does he do? He falls asleep. Now they get out of, why does it always happen that the storms come when you're in the middle of the lake? Why doesn't the storm come when you're 10 feet from shore? And you can turn around and get out really quick, right? But storms usually come when you're in the middle of the lake. And not just any storm came, but this was a violent tempest. Again, the book Desire of Ages tells you that this wasn't just a normal storm, but this was a supernatural storm. Now, I want you to think about Jesus. Now, have you guys ever been in a tiny, small boat, like a John boat? Have you ever been in rough water? In a John boat? Is it smooth? Now, this is in the middle of what is a huge body of water, and in a little, tiny boat. And so the disciples are working because they realize their lives depend on how well they can bail water. But you know what? They got to the point where they realized there wasn't enough of them to bail the water out. Now why? Well, let's read the account. And then I'll start asking some questions so you think about this. <coughs> now when they had left the multitudes, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling with water. But he was in the stern doing what? Sleeping on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're what? Now don't. Isn't it funny that they didn't say that we are, as in Jesus as well? They just meant them. Okay? Okay, just them. Now here's a question for you. When they're bailing water, and they're all worried because this little boat's going to sink, did they not see Jesus sleeping in the front of the boat? The answer from the Desire of Ages is no. But a flash of lightning came, and they saw him fast asleep in the boat. So I asked you, have you ever been in a little tiny boat on rough water? Can you imagine sleeping under those conditions? Okay. Now, my wife and I went on a cruise, the first cruise we went on, and those boats are huge, right? Huge. And we were in the middle of the ocean, and we went through a tiny hurricane. First cruise we went on, and I swore that would be the last <laughs> thing. <laughs> so these big, huge boats have stabilizers that come out from the side of the boat, and fit down, and they're supposed to stabilize the boat. Listen, they couldn't serve you in sit-down restaurants because the plates would fall off the table, and your drinks would fall over. All the people that worked on the boat took all the dramamine that the boat had. <laughs> so again, that was a huge, imagine a tiny boat. How could Jesus sleep through something like this? Now let me ask you a question. Do you think when they were bailing water, they were just sitting there quiet and not saying anything to each other as they were bailing water? Probably, yeah. Now, you guys understand, it wasn't just Peter's boat, but there was other small boats with them. And they were all together going across. So everybody in these boats is bailing water. And don't you think they're screaming at each other, screaming out orders what to do? And the more water that gets in the boat, the more panicked they become. And what's Jesus doing? So listen, was Jesus fully man? It shows you that he was wore out and he needed rest. And when he got into the boat, what did he do? Yes. Have you ever been that tired to where as soon as you sat down or laid down, you were out? Yes. Mm -hmm. The next thing was, is what kind of peace did the disciples have at that point? Good. They had no peace at all. What kind of peace did Jesus have in that boat? See, Jesus was resting in his Father's care. The disciples were resting in their own care. And they had no peace, and they were perishing, and they knew it. Because didn't they ask Jesus that? Do you not care that we, that we, what about him? He was in the boat with them. You would think if they perished, he's going to, no, he walks on water. Do you going to perish? <laughs> Now listen, a day in the life of hanging out with Jesus. 
They just got done with all these multitudes seeing him teach, preach, doing miracles, healing the sick. And they get into a boat. Now in the boat. Now these guys are with Jesus. They're probably almost as tired as he is. Not quite, but almost. And they're rowing. And they're working. Okay? And the storm comes. And now they're in a panic. So, Jesus is asleep. They realize if something's not done, they're going to die. What is it that they finally realize is the only thing that can help them? Jesus. Right? Why didn't they just get bigger buckets? They realize we're perishing. We're going to die. And so they finally looked and said, Jesus, do something. Because they knew that he had the power to save them. But listen. They didn't know what he was going to do, but they weren't expecting what he did. You guys understand that, right? Because you're going to find out from their reaction. They were expecting something, and they didn't care what as long as it saved their lives. But what they got, they never expected. Okay, so let's look at this. Verse 38, but he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? How many times do we cry out, cry out to God and say the same thing? Do you not care that we are perishing? And God's answer is the same as Jesus. Did Jesus care? What Jesus understood is that he wasn't perishing. He had everything under control because he asked them a question. Once he gets the situation calm again, he asked them a question. He never lost control. He was never out of the sight of his father. He was never in <coughs> danger. Now listen, you guys need to understand the full meaning of that. If they perished, they were still never in any danger. If they perished, God was still with them. This life isn't about how long you live and what you get to have. This life is about how you serve your God. And are you willing to do what He's called you to do? And sometimes He calls us to do very hard things. But you don't do them on your own. He's always there with you and He gives you the power to accomplish what He calls. Amen? Amen. Okay, so think about this. Verse 39, And then he arose, they were expecting something, but they never expected this. Verse 39, Then he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, what? Peace. Three little words. Peace, be still. And what happened? This storm was raging. And again, from the Desire of Ages, you find that this was uh, a demon-inspired uh, phenomenon. And Jesus stands up, wakes up, looks at these guys, stands up and goes, Peace, be still. And what happens? Boom! Waves are gone, wind is gone, and the water is calm. Now, if you were the disciples, what would you do? And, and the other people in the boat who saw this, what would your reaction be? The same as theirs. You know what I'm saying? What was their reaction? They were afraid. Now listen. They were afraid when they were bailing water. But that fear was nothing to the fear they had now. Because now they were standing in the presence of God Himself. You understand the difference between the two kinds of fear? Okay. Were they afraid when they thought they were perishing? Yeah. Where were their thoughts at? On themselves. Jesus stands up says three words. Three words. And now they're really afraid. Because what are you going to do? You're stuck in a boat with this guy. And, and this isn't just a guy. You know what I'm saying? This is God in the flesh. Emmanuel. This time they spent with him. They got glimpses of it. And certain times, Jesus would do something that would just blow their minds and make them stand back and go, wow, you're not, you're not normal. You're, you're not like one of us. Who are you? 
Do you remember when Jesus was teaching on the shore and he asked Peter, take me out of the boat? Peter was cleaning his nets as he had spent the whole night fishing, right? Peter says, sure, no problem. He takes them out. After Jesus was done preaching, what did Jesus say to Peter? Go out, take your nets, drop them here. What was Peter's reaction? Was Jesus a fisherman? Was, was Peter a fisherman? Yes. So who knew more about fishing? Peter. In human eyes. Right? In human eyes, Peter's going, dude, we've been out here all night, haven't caught nothing. You want me? And I just cleaned my nets. You want me to go out there again? But listen, you gotta love Peter, because Peter said, Alright, it's what you say, it's what we'll do. What happened? He lays his nets down, catches so much fish that he actually has to get his brother and the other helpers with other boats to come in, reel that thing in, and almost broke the nets and almost sunk the boats. What was Peter's reaction to Jesus after that happened? Peter said, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Peter understood that this wasn't just a regular guy. That this wasn't just a normal man like John and James. There was something different about him. And he was God. Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And here in this account, where it comes to storm, let's look at their reaction. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now you understand that? It wasn't just calm. There was a great calm. We're talking like mirrored water. You know what I'm saying? Nothing. No wind. It was calm. Why? Because the creator of everything spoke. And when he spoke, his creation listened. Do you understand who Jesus really is? Do you understand the power of the Savior that we serve? Do you understand what it means when he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age of the world. Where does Jesus abide when it comes to your personal relationship? Linda? In your heart. If Jesus is with you, who could ever be against you? But he said to them, in verse 40, here's your question. Why are you so what? Now they thought they were going to die. This wasn't just, this wasn't just a little emergency that they overreacted to. This was a serious life and death situation. And they acted like any normal human beings that don't focus on Jesus would act. They were worried for their lives. And what did Jesus say to them? Why are you so afraid? Where is your faith? Now listen, wasn't Jesus right there with them? Were they ever in any danger? Were they ever in any danger? No. Jesus knew when his time would come. Jesus knew how he would die. Was it by drowning? No. Was it by getting lost and being capsized in a small tiny boat? No. Were they in were they ever in any danger? No. Where is your faith? Why are you so afraid? Have you allowed yourself to trust God enough that no matter what happens and no matter what storms the devil throws at you, you have perfect peace with Christ in God? Amen? Amen. Okay, so he asked him, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? And what was their reaction to him? Verse 41 says what? Fear exceedingly. What does that word exceedingly mean? Now listen, this is why I tell you. When they were in the boat and they thought they were going to die, they were afraid. Now they were exceedingly afraid. Why? Because they understood that in their human fallen nature, they're standing in the presence of the divine. And there is 
no storm that Satan will ever bring into your life that's more fearful than standing in the presence of a holy God being a sinful man. So that begs the next question. Well, let's go on with the story. We'll get to that question in a moment. And they feared exceedingly, and they said to one another. Now listen, they didn't say to him. They said to one another, because they're going, as they're trying to back up, but they have no place to go, they're going, what kind of man is this, that even the winds and the waves obey him? What kind? They've never seen anything like this before. Nothing like this had ever been done in the history of mankind. And here he is, three words, and he calms the storm. And he looks to them and he goes, where's your faith? Why are you so afraid? I'm here. Listen, do you realize that it takes more faith on our part than on their part? Jesus was with them. If they opened their eyes and focused, they could see him in the boat. We go through this life and we go through these storms and we don't see him. But you know what? You know what the difference is? He was there in that boat. Now he's here in your heart. And you carry him wherever you go. And that day, wherever he went, was where he was. Understand what I'm saying? Now he's in you, with you, never to leave you and never to forsake you. So that's a night on the sea with Jesus. This is a fun guy to be with, you know what I'm saying? Verse 5, chapter 1, then they came to the other side. Now, the desire of ages tells you that this was at daybreak. The sun was coming up. Jesus had calmed the storm. The water was beautiful. It was calm as the sun came up and it started to touch the land. It was tranquil and peaceful and beautiful. That didn't last. Listen, the devil, if you haven't figured this out yet, let me explain to you. The devil is not going to leave you alone. Amen. As long as you live in this world, in this life, before Jesus comes, the devil is never going to leave you alone. He's always going to harass you, and he's always going to try to weaken your faith and take your focus off of Christ. That's what he does. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, when who came out of the boat? Is that word capitalized? He is Jesus. When Jesus stepped out of the boat, they were in for another surprise. A day in the life with Jesus. you got to admit, these guys were never bored. No. You know what I'm When he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. What did that mean that this man had an unclean spirit? He was demon possessed. You guys understand that, right? Now again, Matthew's gospel tells you there was two that came out. The desire of ages also says there was two. Now what I want you to understand is they just saw Jesus speak and calm the sea. And they looked at him and they were exceedingly fearful. This is how human they are and how human we are. So all that ends, they get done rowing and they get to the shore. And as soon as they get to the shore, these two demon-possessed men come out. Now these were scary guys, okay? The Zyre of Ages tells you that the disciples ran. Jesus is here, gets out of the boat, the demoniacs come this way running to him, and the disciples run that way down the beach. Didn't they just see him calm the storm? Didn't he just rebuke them for not having any faith? And what do they do now? They run away. So listen. He's so cute. The story is in Scripture so that it gives you and I hope and comfort and let us know that God realizes that we are just dust. Okay? Elijah, do you remember his story? He stood up on the mountain and he was for that day God's man. And he had the prophets of Baal trying to call their God and didn't work, did it? 
Elijah calls God, and God doesn't just consume the offering, but God consumes the offering, the wood, and the very stones that the altar was made on, and laps up all the seawater. Have you ever boiled seawater? Salt water? Does it take longer than regular water to boil? The answer is yes. Okay. So when God took this uh, offering of Elijah's, Elijah said to the people, go down to the ocean and get buckets of water and pour it around this altar. And God consumed it all. And Elijah was on top of the world. But again, it didn't take him long to go down to the very depths of the valley. Why? Because he heard that Jezebel wanted to kill him. Now he just got done killing 400 prophets of Baal. 400! Don't you think these prophets fought back? Yeah. Tell me. Do you think they just said, okay, yeah, it'll be okay. Listen, 400, and he gets the message, if you're not dead by morning, let God do so to me, what I want to do to you. Okay? And he ran away. But God understood that he was flesh. He was tired. And God met him where he was. Is that right? And God strengthened him, gave him food, gave him rest, and restored him back. Now listen, if you were Jesus, could you have that kind of uh, patience with the disciples? Probably not. Probably not? Come on now, honestly. <laughs> Do you have that kind of patience with your own children? Yeah. Okay, think about it. He just showed them that he had power over nature itself. <laughs> And, and just within a span of an hour, here they come again, and they're running away. Now, I want you to get this point, and I want you to see, again, who Jesus really is. Let's read this story. When he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the what? <laughs> among the tombs. How would you like to live there? And no one can bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone take him. What you find from the three accounts is that this man was from the city, and because he was demon-possessed, they tried to chain him and shackle him, and tame him, and it couldn't be done. Can you imagine having the strength to break chains, and to break shackles? This man doesn't tell you how he got into this wretched state, but what it does tell you is that he was in this wretched state. And that somehow, he had fallen so far from grace, that he was controlled by demons. And that they chased him out of town, and that he found his dwelling place in the tombs. And at nighttime, he would sit and he would howl and scream and make noise, and you could hear him. It also tells you in Luke's version and Matthew's version that anybody that came by the road that went by that area, they would go out and attack. So nobody would go down there because they knew that that's where that crazy man lived. Okay. So again, law enforcement tried to tame him, to keep him under control, and it didn't work. Okay. So people just stayed away from where he was. Now, isn't it funny that on the other side of where he was, there was a farm that kept swine? Now, didn't these pigs and the herders hear this guy at nighttime and in the daytime? Why didn't it? Make them afraid. See, these are the things I ask myself when I read these stories. Uh, you'll find the answer to that as you start to read the story further. And it has to do with greed and money. Okay? And putting, making a living over following the truth of God. Okay? There are many things that we can do that we don't like to do, but if that's what pays our bills, we'll do that. Okay? And as adults, you know how true that can be. So, 
His dwelling place was among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles, and he broke them, and no one could tame him. Verse 5, And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and doing what? Cutting himself with stones. It got to the point where he wore no clothes, he was totally naked, and he kept cutting himself. So can you imagine when the disciples 